Right. My name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here today with Julia Cresto. It's February 8th, 2021. We're at her family farm here in McMinnville. Thank you so much for joining us today, Julia. Thanks for having me. It's awesome. First question for you, most important question to get started. Why wine? Mm -hmm. um, I think I always gravitated towards the idea of a job and that would be my passion. Um, that I didn't really see the point of separating two things. And so when I was uh, graduating from high school in 2011, I was looking around and didn't really have an idea of what I wanted to do. Um, but I knew I wanted to somehow be involved with um, plants and sustainability. Um, I had really tried to focus on science when I was growing up um, and always had been enamored by nature and all the different facets of it. Um, and I kind of just threw a dart at a wall and ended up at Oregon State um, University in Corvallis and talked to this awesome professor at the time in food science and it was kind of serendipitous like oh you can do brewing or winemaking or you could be a food chemist or you know go more the regulatory route and there's just so many different facets and so I thought that was like a great way to start and see my find my way into what really fit best um, so I started there in 2011 and then that summer got the opportunity to go and do a agricultural oriented tour <laughs> through Italy um, led by Alan Bakalinski. He was one of the uh, wine professors at Oregon State. Um, I think he's not there anymore, but he's an awesome guy. And where it really clicked for me with wine was when we were going through in Prosecco and in Sardinia and seeing these like large scale production places and saying, huh, wow, like, this isn't just the romanticized version of wine like I'd seen in the videos and in the movies and sideways and like thinking about Napa and how my family had portrayed wine mm -hmm. um, and actually seeing how it could be a perfect fit for me. Um, and then it really solidified it when we were in Sardinia and we were at this tiny little winery and it's this place where Alan had done some research basically figuring out how these biofilms grew on this wine with inhibiting lactic fermentation and how that worked on a molecular um, chemistry pathway and that was kind of it for me and we got to taste it and see it and I was just like this makes so much sense I, seeing and being a part of the process mm -hmm. is always something that connected with me um, and it was just kind of history from there. Mm. It's just wine is the most natural process and you get to see all of the steps through grape growing and then bringing it into the winery and finishing it and then you get to make it your own mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. So that's why wine. <laughs> So at that point, you were the wine became interesting to you. I'm curious. Tell me about the rest of your the education for you at Oregon State and, and choosing kind of a focus within wine. Yeah. Um, so I, I actually went back to Oregon State after 2011, going into my sophomore year. I started working at the um, student-run creamery on site and started making Comte cheeses. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to make cheese for the rest of my life now. Um, and I worked there for all three years and um, it was awesome. And I got to really work with my hands and learn the process flow and get experience working with machinery and the quality control aspects out of it. Um, and then I was talking to some older um, folks I was working with who were about to graduate and they'd worked at um, different dairy companies, creameries, it's all big scale for the most part. Mm -hmm. And, but I loved going to these tiny little creameries and 
the romanticized version of it that I saw in Italy and what I did at Oregon State, but you can't make any money doing that. I mean, it, you couldn't make any money doing that at that time. Mm -hmm. It would, hadn't really like blown up the whole craft artisan food thing mm -hmm. yet. And it just seemed like too hard of a, a hill to cross. And so I kind of went back to the wine idea and I was like, well, let's go to a harvest. I'll take off six months my senior year and, you know, really see if I like it um, versus, you know, going and living in Tillamook for the rest of my life, but working for <laughs> Tillamook cheese, um, which, you know, it's a great place. They make wonderful products. I love them, <laughs> um, but I needed a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And the funny thing is that I chose to go work for Gala <laughs> for my first harvest. So going from, you know, I didn't really want to work at a huge industrial creamery, but then I went and worked for the biggest winery in the world, at the biggest winery in the world. Um, which was really cool though, because I worked at the Pilot Winery, which um, is basically the step up from their little micro winery. Mm -hmm. And then trying everything out, testing it before you scale it up. And that was awesome because you didn't, you didn't feel like you were just, you know, mass producing mm -hmm. wine. You, we dealt with low quality fruit, but our job was to make that low quality fruit into high quality wine, mm -hmm. which was so cool to see and see how many traditional winemaking like techniques that we can use and bring it back from just mass production mm -hmm. and increase the quality from those techniques. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I got a really great opportunity to work with some brilliant like scientists and engineers that was just phenomenal and technology that they were creating and impact and introduce it into the winemaking. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'll ever do that ever again, but it was really <laughs> cool to be a part of it. Um, and then the thing that I learned most at Gallo was the sensory aspect. I got to work with sensory scientists. They put you through um, a sensory fault testing like mm -hmm. course, mm -hmm. and then working with my winemaker one-on-one -on -one every day, we would taste through every ferment. We would, you know, she would force us to think about what was going on in the wines and with the textural, the sensorial aspects of each of those processes. And that really like made me think that even though I'm not making great wine, there was so many great things that came from that. Um, so, and I got to make a little bit of my own wine that first year, so that was really cool. Um, that was just like, you know, the cherry on top. <laughs> and, um, but I, I lived in Turlock, California. Mm -hmm. Like, it was awful, not wine country at all. <laughs> but I'm really glad that I started at Gallo. Um, it was a pretty pivotal point in my life and they treat you really well. So I think it also gave me a good starting point for how I want to be treated as an employee and how mm -hmm. I want to treat people as mm -hmm. employees. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So then I went back to school and um, finished off my year as a senior at Oregon State. I graduated in 2015 and I um, had gone up to Gallo's Napa winery, um, William Hill, during harvest, and we were doing some flash detente trials there. Um, but, and then I got there and I'm like, oh my God, this is so beautiful. I wanna make wine here. I wanna just walk through these vineyards every day, all day. It was just like the epitome of romanticized winemaking to me. And after working in Turlock, I was like, yeah, I got to go to Napa right now. <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's great. I'm from San Diego. I can go home more. I can see my people. Um, maybe California is where I should really be. Mm -hmm. um, so I finished off my wine classes at Oregon State. Um, they were really awesome working with 
James Osborne and Elizabeth Tomasino. Um, it's funny now that I'm looking back at it, like it's so great that I went to Oregon State because there's such a good reference and to have a, you know, a relationship with them where they already knew me when mm -hmm. I was um, a y younger person <laughs> um, is pretty neat. And um, I feel very lucky to have worked, uh, learned from two people that are passionate about organ and wine as well mm -hmm. and want to make it better and see it through mm -hmm. and evolve. Um, so that was great. I didn't think very much of it at the time because um, Oregon State was pretty much a big brewing um, program. So I was one of two people in my food science department. No, maybe, maybe more than two people, but like there were not that many people that actually went into wine um, from my graduating class. Mm -hmm. So I was an oddball <laughs> <laughs> and no one understood why. And it's funny because now I see more people at the Oregon Wine Symposium and they're all going back to wine. Mm -hmm. So it's funny how it's full circle, but Oregon State's really great because it sets you up for the, the undetermined path. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't need, you don't need to um, be 100% sure about what you want to do, but they give you the, the tools to maybe make those jumps later on in life mm -hmm. and um, adapt your knowledge from one, one point of, you know, brewing science to wine science, mm -hmm. like water chemistry. That's pretty important for water treatment. <laughs> in wineries, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it makes you think more about solutions and buffers and why a wine would do that more than in um, when you're dealing with soils and why tangent things. Anyways, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> um, but Oregon State was really great. It's a great opportunity to figure out and get the building blocks mm -hmm. for leading mm -hmm. you into the future. And I don't think it's necessarily taken as seriously as it should be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I went to Napa after Oregon State. And I worked at Stag's Leap Wine Cellars in Stag's Leap District as a um, vineyard slash lab intern, um, which was really cool. So I got to work with all of their different vineyard properties which was about 40 different vineyards. Yeah. <laughs> and drive all around Napa Valley um, and do crop estimations, pest identification, just, and really just like start to understand the viticulture process. Mm -hmm. Cause I didn't get that at Oregon State. I got, you know, obviously I know, knew how plants grew and like pathways, um, but I didn't take any viticulture classes. Mm -hmm. So this was a really great chance for me to start to shed the light into that mm -hmm. um, but you know you're only seeing half of the process so it's still um, different um, and so then I did all of the grape sampling and would then bring it into the lab and mm -hmm. test everything and then moved into the lab full-time for harvest and they did everything in-house there, um, so that was pretty cool. Like, I got to plate and, like, identify, um, you know, different microorganisms mm -hmm. um, and do all of the enzymatic stuff in-house, and that was, there was a lot of wines. That was like a 50, th no, it was more than that. I think it was like 50 to 75,000 case production. Mm -hmm. It's pretty big. Um, but, I mean, so we we're just plugging and chugging all the time. And uh, also from that, I, I started going out and tasting all the time um, because I wanted to learn more than just being at a winery and, and having to rely on um, my winemaking team to teach me. 
Um, I wanted to go out and taste things and smell things and make my own associations um, because I thought about going to grad school or going back and working for Gallo and just, um, you know, someone else giving me the information. But I, th I learned from when I worked at Gallo that winemaking is not that hard. You can make good wine out of bad grapes. You just have to do magic, basically. Um, a lot of magic. Um, so I wanted to learn about wine from the people that have made it into a craft and into an art. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of set on my own education through wine tasting, which it's funny. Um, Every, like my old bosses, like I used to work for work with JP um, at Ponzi and Louisa, they, they're like, how have you been to all these wineries? Like, I don't even know what these are. And I'm like, oh, I'll just go out and taste. Like, what else am I gonna do? Um, Cause you're just curious. And it's such a great way to learn. And the, everyone's so happy to teach you if you ask the right questions. Um, so I was in Napa for six months and I didn't really like it. <laughs> um, it was pretty competitive and a pretty big boys club and I didn't have a UC Davis degree, which everyone has a UC Davis degree and it's very incestual. Sorry, UC Davis, but, um, so I made a couple good friends, which was great, but I didn't feel like it was going to be the end all place for me mm -hmm. um, and really longed to be back in Oregon even though I'd never made wine there um, I just thought it was unfinished um, so I reached out to Elizabeth Thomas you know she went to school in New Zealand for her um, master's and PhD I think mm -hmm. and she gave me a laundry list of places to apply to and I was like all right and I ended up at Craggy Range um, in Hawks Bay, and they made wine in, from Hawks Bay vineyards, which were Bordeaux and Rhone varietals, um, Martinboro, which is down more near um, the Wellington area, and that's very Pinot and Chardonnay, and then Marlborough, um, which is savvy. Uh, and so it was a really great opportunity to work with all the different varietals in high quality scale mm -hmm. um, and, you know, deal with all different types of m machinery because they really did focus on like doing Pinots and Chardonnays and aromatic whites in like, you know, a four ton press versus when you're doing a savalanche pressing where you're pressing through 40 tons of savvy at a time and you know you have an auger for your pumice it's just so cool um so it was a great education in how there's so many different aspects to winemaking and how it can all be efficient and the quality can be really good you just have to um pay attention and learn and um the Craggy Range team, uh, they, they hire a lot of Americans and internationals. And so I have a lot of really good friends in the Valley that are, you know, I've worked with them or they worked years after me or whatever. Um, but they instill really good camaraderie within your intern team. And I loved that about them. And I think that I don't think that they truly like understand the scope of what they've created, um, but there's just there's a connection, and um, they've that family has done a really great job um, bolstering the New Zealand wine industry, but also the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Like Oregon is, we are very lucky for that opportunity mm -hmm. um, to have worked there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, that was the first real time that I made Pinot that was good Pinot. Um, and 
Matt Stafford, the winemaker at the time, I remember him teaching me to what reduction smelled like. And um, that year there was a lot of reduction. It was a wet year and so we had some stinky ferments, things were a little bit green. Um, but it was really beautiful to see how a Pinot ferment worked mm -hmm. um, versus a cab ferment mm -hmm. and how much beauty there can be in it and the smells and aromatics. Um, you know, I was used to just, you know, pump overs and pump overs and pump overs and that's where I learned how to do a punch down for the first time and did my first pijage and um, dug out a wood couve for the first time and that really um, resonated with me and I got to, you know, begin to fall in love with Pinot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And then after that, I had connected with um, the enologist at Penner Ash. She's now the assistant winemaker, Lauren mm -hmm. Wheeler. Mm -hmm. And she'd worked at Craggy the year before. And so I had a good in um, to go work at Harvest there. And it was, I was really excited because I'd really worked with mostly male dominated winemaking teams since my first Harvest. Um, and I wanted to get back to like learning from a woman's perspective because um, there's, there's a big difference in the way that a female winer, winery is run versus a male winery. And not in a bad way, it's just we have different um, mindsets. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, at the time it was Lynn, it was Kate, and it was Lauren, and it was their cellar master, Nick. So it was like a very female dominated team, and I loved it. And, um, I started there in the tasting room during the summertime and worked with their team to in the like transition period of being bought by JFW. So that was really interesting to see. And like, oh, there's all these winemakers from all over the world and you're gonna pour wine for them and tell them all about Penner Ash. I'm like, <laughs> okay, I started here a week ago. <laughs> um, but it, it really was awesome and felt cool because Oregon does have all those connections mm -hmm. and it was just another great way to be excited about Oregon wine and everyone else is excited about Oregon wine mm -hmm. and you know Lynn started such a wonderful thing at, with um, her winery and um, I wanted just to learn from her and see where, how she did it. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's one, her, her and Louise are one of the OGs. Mm -hmm. They they made the way. They broke the path, and um, I feel really grateful to have learned from both of them. Um, Lynn's scary. I was so scared of her at first, <laughs> um, and she's still scary, but in a great way just because it's sarcasm. And I think that's where I started to like see, oh, I can, I can be a little bit sassy at work. I can just, you know, be more myself and don't have to um, be one of the guys all the time. Because mm -hmm. that's kind of it, is that in the wine industry, if you're working in the cellar, then you kind of have to assimilate to a male perspective. And at Penner Ash, it was very different because their winery had been designed by a woman and they didn't think the same way. It was ran by women for the most part. Mm -hmm. And um, that was one of my most fun harvests that I've ever had, even though it was really hard because it was 2016 and that was a big, early, hot crop. And I was just running around all the time. Um, and Linda's three punch downs a day, so that was a workout. Um, but you prove yourself 
in those situations. And, and I think that's the thing with women is that they give you the opportunity to prove yourself um, when, because they've had to do it. And it's not about like if a man or a woman, woman is better at a job, it's just because of your sex, it's just about if you have the opportunity to, sh to prove yourself. Mm -hmm. um, not everyone does. And I've seen, worked with plenty of guys that don't have what it takes um, to cut it. You know, uh, that harvest I worked with another woman uh, who's a winemaker now in Australia, and we were the only ones that would be punching down our six ton fermenters every day, and the guys would just let us do it. So, you know, there's something that really, you have to prove yourself and show that you have the grit to do it um, and make it in the Oregon wine world, because mm -hmm. it's not easy. It's very different than other wine regions, and, um, it's great to prove it to yourself. Um, so yeah, I w was at Penner Ash and then 2016 and then went to Australia with my friend JJ. She was there and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I knew that Oregon was like the place I wanted to be because I was just fell in love with the valley. I had those like aha moments where, oh my God, this is the best. Like I'm power washing a sorting line, but there's a beautiful lit up like Mount Hood in the background in the sunset. And how, what else would I'd rather be doing in my life? Um, I wanna work hard and, and be surrounded by beauty. Mm -hmm. um, but, so I didn't know what I wanted to do because there were no real jobs everything was super competitive and I was still really young. I was 23 and so it's hard, it's hard to get hired in a full-time position when you're 23, <laughs> um, even if you have a college degree. Mm -hmm. um, so I went to Australia and I didn't think I wanted to go out to Australia because I'd always just thought it was like mass production, big tank farms, which it is. Um, but my friend JJ told me to go to Yangara, which was a Jackson family winery, it is a Jackson family winery. And um, I worked there for a long time. It was like six months of harvest because you usually start in January in the McLaren Vale. And it, we didn't start harvesting fruit until March. It was awful and it rained and it was just sloppy um, and I, but it was really cool because we would, you know, work four days a week in January or four hours, four hours a day and then go to the beach, which was five, 15 minutes down the road. Like, and I just got to experience so much. And there's three different wine regions around there. Um, the Clare, oh, four, Barossa, McLaren Vale and the Adelaide Hills. So that was just like another, another way that I got to educate myself even more, just constantly going out and tasting and um, understanding the Australian wine industry because theirs is so backwards than ours. Like they started really big in mass production because they were subsidizing farming for um, wine at the time. And, um, and then they've gone to the small micro wineries, the craft. Um, which is really cool because that's kind of the case in the United States to some point, um, but not in Oregon. Um, so finding those places in Australia that had just so much soul and the people behind that was really cool to see. Um, I really fell in love with Grenache. Like, uh, it made me think that maybe I'm not supposed to be in Oregon. Maybe I'm supposed to go down to uh, Slow and make wine in um, outside of like my, my parents' hometown mm -hmm. in Ventura. Mm -hmm. Be so much easier. Um, but no. And then <laughs> um, going back to Australia. Um, so it was a really wet harvest, and everything was green. 
It was not Australian style, that vintage. And so the winemakers were really experimenting and had to make decisions with the fruit quality. Mm -hmm. And I think that was one of the most interesting things to see is like, what do you do when your fruit is like, it's got sour rot. Mm -hmm. What does it smell like? What, what differences does it do to the ferment? Um, I was finally getting to that point where I like, I saw what a normal ferment should look like. I mean, 2016 at Penner Ash, the ferments were beautiful. It was easy harvest mm -hmm. in terms of like quality. Um, but then in Australia, it was the absolute opposite. And so we were doing um, a lot more additions into things, but then also letting wine be itself. Um, we did submerged caps with Italian varietals, which I'd never seen before. It was like some voodoo magic we used. Um, the plastic, um, you know, fake turf to hold down the grapes with these like metal um, plates. It was weird. I don't know if that's allowed, but um, yeah, we did it. <laughs> and then, you know, we worked with, we did carbonic maceration with Grenache. We did, they had these really cool um, ceramic eggs that we did skin contact um, Marsan Rousson and I got to hand punch down these ceramic eggs every single day and see, visually see and feel and smell how the ferments changed when the white grapes were left on skins more. And that was just such a textural thing that if you don't see a ferment every single day, like you don't understand. Um, and it's so cool. I mean, no one does that. Um, I mean, I think they they leave them on skins for 160 days, and then, um, and then you taste it, and you're like, how is this not like ultra phenolic and like bitter? And tannins just go in a wave, and that's what I learned, not only with the white grapes, but with um, the the cabs and the syrah. Um, especially when you have green fruit, it's not only about just like masking the greenness, it's working with it and, and working it out because mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely a pendulum. Um, and I think that's something that isn't necessarily understood a lot and you kind of just have to, cause let it ride and believe that it's gonna be okay. And that's a lot of winemaking is just, you know, being able to see it and then, you know, trusting that that's gonna happen in the future. Um, it's a lot of blind faith. But that's because people have seen it before and it's a craft, it's not, I mean, we have science to prove that that happens, but the only reason why we do half of the things that we do is because of what other people have tried mm -hmm. and, you know, mistakenly done as experiments and figure it out and it worked. And so I think it's a really cool thing is just like the artistry of learning from other winemakers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was a really great experience working in Australia for that. Um, and so after Australia, I, I went back to Oregon. Um, and at the end of harvest of 2016, um, we'd done a wine tasting with um, the winemaking team at Penner Ash around the valley. And our first stop was Bergstrom. And at the time, I did not like Chardonnay at all. And it was the first wine of the flight. And it was their 20, 2014 Old Stones Chardonnay. And I was like, oh my God, this, this is Chardonnay? My goodness. And it was kind of just like, 
I need to work for this person. This is fantastic. I had that moment. I, you don't, you don't know when you have those moments until you have those moments. And you're like, wow. So it kind of changed my life, um, to be honest, uh, working for the Bergstroms. Um, they believe so much in like educating their people. Mm -hmm. They believe in stewardship and, you know, keeping their lands like balanced and holistically and, you know, follow through into the winery where Josh is constantly like learning from other winemakers and listening and seeing what he sees and adapting it. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was like one of the most thoughtful and profound places that I've worked. Um, I started there in the summer and got to work with like helping them get ready for harvest and rack their their 2016 wines. And I remember we were like racking and they weren't going to filter. I'm like, what do you mean you're not going to filter? I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. And so it kind of shed this light into my, my psyche of like, not everything that is traditional or what you learn in a textbook needs to be done. There's def you definitely have to see the whole picture, mm -hmm. make your best choices because just because it's plug and chug doesn't mean that you need to do that. <laughs> um, and so that was an awesome thing, learning about the sensorial oak profiles, because Josh uses a lot of different oaks that a lot of other people don't use, you know, using fudras and punchins and demi mutes and just like so many different things and smelling them and being able to like taste the difference was awesome. And then they opened like the most beautiful wines in the world. And I had no idea of any of that at the time. Um, and I'm so grateful for them sharing and sharing their knowledge because that's why we're in the wine industry is to share knowledge and to, you know, it brings people together and that's what wine should do. Um, and the Bergstroms have a really wonderful way of bringing people together with their wines. Mm -hmm. um, Carolyn, Caroline is one of the kindest people ever, but also the sassiest. And um, Josh is just a big goofball. And that's where I really started paying attention to sparkling wine, mm -hmm. is through their, um, their love of sparkling wine. I mean, Caroline's from Burgundy, Josh studied there, and they just, they always um, are celebrating with sparkling and um, the great thing about the Bergstroms is that they take the, the, the scariness away from those like um, important wines where they're just very like upfront and make it into a learning experience and you can understand why mm -hmm something is one way or another. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think I would be where I am if I hadn't worked there. Um, it got me interested in, um, you know, organic growing and biodynamics and, you know, maybe just questioning what we're doing and more mm -hmm. um, because of their process that they're, they're going on. Um, and, you know, that's, that's all I started doing from the beginning is just questioning why we're doing something for what reason when you start on the winemaking process like but it was a really great place to like stop the you know harvest hopping track mm -hmm. and like just being in the cellar and um working and working and working working it gave me perspective on 
yeah, I do want to have my own personal label. I do want to, you know, grow grapes. I do want more than just being a winemaker. I want to have a connection to the land, mm -hmm. which is really important. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I worked for them for almost a year. And at that time, I was dating a boy from New Zealand and thought, oh, maybe I'll go live in New Zealand full time. And so I got a job working harvest in New Zealand in central Otago and um, then broke up like two weeks before I got there. And in that breakup, I applied to Ponzi. <laughs> and um, it was the best thing that ever could happen to me. <laughs> Um, cause that was kind of the, the, um, the point where everything started changing cause I was staying in one place for a long time. Mm -hmm. I got to really, and I was in Oregon, I was experiencing Oregon harvest, but I wasn't fully there all the time. So seeing through like a spring, I hadn't had a spring in like five years. And that's weird, it screws you up. <laughs> um, your body just feels out of whack. Um, along with, you know, the binge drinking too. Um, but yeah, so I went to Central Otago, made wine, it was awesome. They, I worked with some people that had worked in Oregon wine and so their influence was very Oregon, but with Central Otago fruit. Um, so it was it was really easy to work there. Um, I it was just like being back at home, mm -hmm. making wine. It was great. Um, I worked at Akarua, and they had a sparkling program, and which was really interesting because in the New Zealand wine they focused more on non vintage sparkling, and so they'd make a non vintage every year, and then. Um, every now and then if they had some really good reserve barrels, they would make a vintage sparkling. And I remember going in and being able to top the sparkling wines and being like, what are you doing with like 2010 base wine? That seems really weird. <laughs> Don't you just throw it in a tank and bottle it? Like, isn't that what you do? Um, so, that was one of the first times when I saw um, sparkling wine production and the fact that it could be more complex mm -hmm. and um, art driven than I thought. Um, and it was pretty cool. And I brought that back to Ponzi and we started holding over sparkling barrels and um, you know, blending in b vintages into our, you know, wines and the creating the mouthfeel and aromatics that can change so much with just having these high acid wines age in barrel a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. and the slow oxidation is just, it's mind blowing how much it can change. Um, and so that was pretty, pretty cool to, to get that kind of like psh, explosion of um, inspiration mm -hmm. um, from one place. Mm -hmm. And Central Tago is so cool to live in. Like you're just hiking around all the time and the soils are like so new, but so similar to Oregon, you know, it's all volcanic, but it was not made that long ago. Mm -hmm. It's always changing. So that was something really cool to see is like, their grape growing is so different because it's so dry and it's so hot and it's nothing like Oregon Pinot. When people say that Central Otago is like the most similar thing to Oregon Pinot, that's not true. Martinboro is very close, I'd say, in a like flavor profile, but Central Otago is just like intensely aromatic and more structured and their soils uh, you know, give a higher pH to their wines. And I think that it's really 
great to see such differences in Pinot Noir and how it can affect um, the, the final product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so grape growing there was really cool. It was really hot and then really cold all the time. <laughs> um, it's just extreme and it's fantastic to see because the valley is pretty moderate. We don't see that much change, but it also gave, shed some light for like the future mm -hmm. of our world and saying like, well, they're making really great wine in arid climate with big temperature swings. Yeah, they have to invest more in frost protection, but you know, if, if it happens here in the valley where it becomes drier and more extreme, we'll be okay. Oregon Pinot will be okay. We might need to diversify a little bit more, but we'll be okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so then I went back to Oregon and started working for Louisa and the Ponzi's and just being part of a freaking Oregon wine legend. <laughs> It's really weird <laughs> when you're just talking to Dick Ponzi all the time and he's just this guy. I remember meeting him for the first time and um, I was in the lab. Oh, sorry. I worked at Ponzi originally as a cellar assistant and um, lab enologist. And then um, so kind of like a dual role. So I ran all the analyses and helped in the cellar but then also got to be a part of all the blending and tasting stuff, which was cool. It was a great step for, um, you know, getting into full-time winemaking um, because as I'd seen before, it wasn't very easy being a young person. And I kind of had these expectations for myself that I needed to be an enologist by 25, I needed to be a system winemaker by 30, and da 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 da, and, and lead this path. Um, but when I went to Ponzi, I was working on a very collaborative team, mm -hmm. and am working on a very collaborative team, and saw that those, that process wasn't really important anymore, and you can learn um, more if, if you just kind of go with the flow mm -hmm. and you don't need to be climbing up the ladder as fast as you think you need to because wine is a learned thing. Mm -hmm. It's not a destination. Um, so yeah. And then I started working at the Ponzi's and it was a, very different because I had been in McMinnville where all my friends were, you know, in a five mile radius of wineries. And I was working all the way out at Ponzi, driving 45 minutes to work over Bell Road. And that's a scary road. It's a scary road. Um, and it just felt like very different um, than the rest of the valley. Um, and but in a good way, because it still had so much of the history of the original, you know, family and vineyard, and they still, I mean, it's still family run. So mm. that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, just learning from Louisa in her Chardonnay program, I was really annoying. Um, the first year, actually, I'm probably still really annoying, um, where I just kind of forced her to, to teach me about her Chardonnay programs, because that's her baby. It's what she loves most, and it's what I love most, um, other than sparkling. But just, like, bonding about being acid junkies and, um, you know, bringing all these cool Chardonnays and... Being able to blend my first Chardonnay at Ponzi Vineyards, the 2017, was so cool. I didn't even make that wine, but just seeing her thought process in how it went together was really beautiful to see for the first time. Um, because her, her winemaking style for Chardonnay is not like 
the rest of the valley. She is in the oxidative camp and those wines don't, they don't come together until they come together. And you just have to blindly believe that they're gonna come together. Um, and I was coming from working with winemakers in the valley that were much more reductive style. And everyone shamed me for that a lot when we were tasting. I'm like, I don't smell reduction. That just smells good. <laughs> um, so it was, it was a lot of like relearning and kind of getting over myself and um, just accepting that I'm part of the process and I'm learning and these are different wines and Oregon wine, depending on which AVA you're in, is just worlds different. Mm -hmm. And I love that about mm -hmm. Oregon wine. Mm -hmm. Learning about laurel wood soils, it's, it's pretty neat. Like those wines are fantastic. And I am really excited to see where that new AVA is going. Mm -hmm and mm -hmm. the winemakers that are making and grape growers there's more vineyards that are going in and more people are paying attention which is cool mm -hmm. because of louisa and and dick of course <laughs> sorry <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah it's pretty cool why did you decide to apply at Ponzi? And, and tell me about the process of, of you hadn't actually had a full-time thing yet. You'd been, you know, running around, around, running around doing harvest. Mm -hmm. What uh, what was it like getting that first kind of yeah. permanent thing? Um, well, I I applied at a couple of different wineries, and I was like <laughs> always near the the other person when making the decisions, and heard a few no's, and that sucked. Um, and then my friend, you know, it's just word of mouth in Oregon for the most part. Like, you can put a posting up, but it, you know, getting a reference from someone else or hearing a tidbit is what you want. Mm -hmm. um, so my friend told me that Louisa wanted to hire someone that had a lot of experience and lab and seller oriented and... You know, I, I wanted to work for another woman again and thought she would be like the best one since she was like the first one. <laughs> and just how much um, experience and, and experimentation that family has gone through mm -hmm. to create Oregon wine. Mm -hmm. It was just like, yeah, that, that seems like we would line up. And their stewardship, like, they, Louisa has been on the live board for forever and has made huge changes with um, viticulture management and making things more sustainable. I mean, their winery is, you know, Gravity Flow, and that was pretty cool. Um, but I want, after I interviewed there and understood more that it was like a team and everyone's, you know, opinions mattered and I, you can bring ideas to the table and be, you know, considered seriously. That was really um, interesting to me and mm -hmm. I wanted that. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, what was the last part of the question? I'm curious sort of curious like what it's like now having that permanent mm. piece you, you hadn't been in one place for very long you'd been yeah. bouncing around now you're tied to a place that that has a yeah, you're, you're permanently part of a place tell me yeah. how that kind of changed your mindset and changed your your sort of style um well you're not thinking about yourself first off you're thinking about a place and you're thinking about your team um the benefit of moving around so much is that you get to see so many different styles and um, experience different, you know, leadership roles and techniques and then pull from it best you can um, and implement it into how you fit into the piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was really hard the first year. Um, to not want to just get up and go and go somewhere else. Um, 
but it was so exciting to see a wine through like I, I was so excited the first time we put a wine in bottle. I was like, this is so neat. <laughs> um, but in being part of all of it, you know, all the blending trials, all the finding trials, like the cross flow, tasting the CO2 levels in the wine to make sure that it was perfect. There's so many things that go into finishing a wine that you miss out when you're hopping harvests and you don't understand the true complexity. Raw is so wine, right? Uh, wine so raw after it is pressed and just finished and sulfured and there's so much more evolution and we don't get to see that if you're just making wine mm -hmm. um, and hopping around. So the perspective is changes. Um, it allows you to stop and think more and see the effects per harvest and um, how you know a growing season can be different, how we can implement different vine vineyard techniques mm -hmm. um, and different winemaking techniques. Um, and just constantly adapt because vines and nature is not just like it doesn't stay the same so we need to constantly be like questioning what we're doing and getting validity in the style that we're making mm -hmm. so yeah it's been really cool I've got to take on more of the experimental programs at Ponzi and keep track of things and it's given me so much like foresight and um, ability to have a cause and effect kind of mentality. And um, I, I think that I really should have probably gotten a full-time full, full job sooner if I wasn't, you know, so young. <laughs> um, but that's the hard thing. It's like, you you can't get a full-time job because you don't have experience but you can't get experience unless you don't do harvest but then they don't want you to do too many harvests because then you just seem flighty <laughs> so um it's a hard balance and i don't i don't know if that's gonna be the case anymore i don't i don't know if people will be able to hop harvest as much mm -hmm. um but i think that might be good because I think that it'll allow for more focus on the wine and, you know, teaching people from the ground up mm -hmm. and investing in people. And that's a really important thing. Mm -hmm. So I think that it should be a good thing. So at this point, you, you've talked during your, your kind of path to this point, you've talked a lot about the, the kind of the aha moments for yourself and the, the things you've taken away and the things you're thinking about for the future. So mm -hmm. tell me about the moments of Chardonnay, the moments of sparkling, the moments of wanting to have your own space and your own grip. Tell me how that kind of coalesces into where we are here and, and what you're working on now. Mm. Um, so this, so this place, um, is my family's farm and this happened in 2019 we took over management at the beginning of 2020 um and it's kind of like a homesteaders fantasy paradise um it's a little bit crazy no it's a lot bit crazy um we had um i don't think i would have taken the jump to start a label and make my wine at this moment if it wasn't for this place and it wasn't for the time. Um, the Chardonnay and sparkling wines, it's always something that I wanted to do. Um, it's just, you know, with the wine industry, it costs a lot of money. Um, and it kind of seems out of reach for mm -hmm. a lot of time. I mean, mm -hmm. it is out of reach. Um, and once we bought this place in 2019, um, 
there's a vineyard here. We have about um, four acres of triple seven Pinot planted. Um, and we saw the wine being made and they're making Pinot from it and then an occasional um, sparkling, mostly just for personal consumption. And then um, the Lundines are the next door neighbors and he makes um, sparkling wines and Pinots. And um, he had one year used some of our grapes for his um, non-vintage blend, which was really cool. And then just the idea that this could be a good option. You know, we're low elevation. We're not in a special AVA. We're in the Willamette Valley AVA. Like, I mean, yeah, it's cool soils and we have a nice little microclimate, but there's more beauty to wine that can be shown if you make it into sparkling wine. Mm -hmm. Sparkling wine is magic. Like, it's literal magic. Um, these grapes, you know, they don't pick up a lot of um, color. And so it was kind of like, uh, they're very fruity. The tannins aren't very like big and obtrusive when I was tasting them. I'm like, hmm, well, maybe we can just do some sparkling wine. And I was thinking about just like at first doing two barrels in my garage and um, seeing it through and then Louise was like, why are you going to do that and put it into, you know, a secondary fermentation and bottle if it's not that good? So she kind of pushed me to actually move forward and take it more seriously. Because um, if you're doing all the work of growing the grapes, it's kind of a disservice to ferment it poorly. Um, and I've been making wine... I mean, I know it's only been like five years, but this was my 10th harvest and I can make wine. That's like the easiest thing in this whole scheme of a crazy farm. <laughs> like that was the one thing of 2020 where I like, yeah, I could do that for sure. Um, but so it just kind of made sense and everything else here was so unknown and constantly a challenge and you know learning how to raise cattle and um manage pastures and you know deal with a well pump i'd never lived in a place with a well that was fun losing water on july 4th <laughs> that was great um so just it seemed like the safest bet mm -hmm. um and i knew i could make a wine that you know, it wasn't like the world's best wine, but it was somewhere to start. And it doesn't, wine doesn't need to be like a ethereal expression in every moment. Sometimes it can just be fun. And sparkling wine is really fun and it can be really good. Um, so that's kind of where I'm, I'm going with it. Like this new project, the little Hellion, it's, it's, it's supposed to be fun and it's supposed to be approachable, which I think that Oregon wine needs to start marketing itself more as is approachable because we're going to lose out on a lot of people buying that's why seltzer is so big. It's because you don't have to think about it. It's just is what it is. Um, so I sectioned off my portion of the vineyard this harvest and paid for some barrels to ferment in and rented some space from Louisa at our winery and was ready to rock for 2020. And then we'd already had COVID. And um, the day before I picked my, okay. I also got some fruit from my friend um, who I went to college with over in, what is it called? 
It's in the Laurelwood AVA. Her place is called Jessie Estate. It's a really awesome um, property. Her family has been farming there for like 50 years. They've got vineyards and blueberries and, and Anna, um, we're the same age. We were um, in the same dorm and she's taking over the grape growing for her family and she'd been planting some new uh, Chardonnay baby vines, 76, and um, farm, trying to farm it organically, which is like, you know, you, I'm all for that. And um, I went out there with some friends on August 2nd, no, September 2nd, and um, picked some shard to throw in with my Pinot. And um, that day was uh, the morning before the winds changed mm -hmm. for the smoke, um, for the fires. And so I picked all my Chardonnay and then brought it to the winery. And then um, we came back to the farm and the smoke had started rolling in, the winds had started. And we were just running around trying to like secure things, get the animals inside, like get them enough water. Um, and you know, it was just, it was like a horror movie. Um, and my Pinot pick was the next morning. So I was just a nervous wreck. It was scary. Um, and I've been through firestorms. I'm from San Diego. So I grew up through multiple firestorms. So it's kind of like PTSD, like, um, but it's much scarier when you're an adult and you've got a lot more um, things riding on it. Like I was just in awe of 2020 at that moment. Um, I was like, really, <laughs> we have to do this right now. Um, but I was really lucky that we picked my Pinot that morning because it didn't have any smoke taint. And my neighbor, Michael Lundin, he tracked the fruit over to Ponzi that morning and um, I'd gotten to work. I wasn't there for the pick because I our interns were starting harvest that day, so I had to be there. And that's when the Shehalem Mountain fire started. And my boss, Louisa, had slept on the grass fields that evening because they got evacuated because it was literally right by their house. And, um, you know, we were all just like in a state of like, how are we going to do this? Um, Michael got there and the fire trucks were filling up their engines with water and we were trying to unload and they're like, no, no, no. <laughs> And they're just like truck after truck after truck coming in, like filling up. And I was like, yay, <laughs> I'm so happy to make my first wine. <laughs> and it's like, ah! <laughs> but we unloaded it and got it pressed and then got everything in tank before we had to get evacuated from the winery. So that happened. It was a very eventful, start to my wine label mm -hmm. and but in spite of all of it I am so so lucky to have not have picked any later because mm -hmm. I would have been screwed I mean to start start a wine label during a vintage where almost everything has smoke taint that's I mean it's impossible mm -hmm. my um, co-worker he was gonna start his own label this year too and he had to nix it and you know it's really hard to see so many people's dreams like fall apart and like you have have a redeemable product mm -hmm. and you know sometimes I feel really guilty but um, it's it was just the fates, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I'm happy that I do have something to, you know, show in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So that's where Little Hellion has started. It's a very eventful story. Turned out to be a very apt name for your for your label. Yeah. <laughs>
Tell us where the name came from and, and what sort of the timeline is for your first release. So the name um, kind of, it came from my older brother. Um, he is very, uh, he's the wordsmith in the family. So um, we were having drinks one day and he always calls me a little shit. And I'm like, oh, well, you can't really put that on your, your label. <laughs> so that was like a good middle ground. And I feel like it really encaptures like the, the, ba the, the focus of people that I look up to in the wine industry, like Lynn and Josh and Louisa, like they're all badasses. And that's the person that I want to be. I mean, sometimes you, you know, push the envelope a little bit and ruffle some feathers, but you got to raise a little hell sometimes. That's so cheesy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and winemaking needs to be pushing the envelope. Mm -hmm. So Little Hellion is that. Um, I, the way that the wine's gonna go for release is I'm going to be putting it into Tourage this June um, and hopefully releasing it in two to three years. Not really sure on the timeline for that. It's kind of, it's kind of like the process with sparkling. Like, you know when it's ready, when it's ready. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't know where this product's, project's gonna go. Like, I don't know what kind of um, flavor profiles I'm gonna end up with. Like, that's the really exciting thing about sparkling wine is that, you know, you can put it in bottle and then it just evolves so much. Mm -hmm. So I'm just believing in the process and gonna not try to manipulate it too much because if you do then you're just gonna cause yourself so much grief um, but so I'm gonna make another vintage next year and this year's vintage is going to be um, my kind of uh, flagship cuvee I'm not gonna call it a brute rosé or blanc de blanc I mean it's mostly Pinot Noir um, from the Willamette Valley AVA, so just kind of making it very approachable, um, consumer driven. Mm -hmm. I want my, my friends to drink these wines, mm -hmm. um, my non-wine friends who don't know anything about wine. Um, I want my family to drink it and I want it to be, um, I want people to be able to understand how it's made and be able to pick up on the flavor profiles easily. Mm -hmm. I don't want it to be like, I hate when you're tasting with friends and they're like, what do you taste really? I'm like, no, what do you taste? That I don't care what I taste. I want to know what you taste. <laughs> so people just need to be more confident with it because wine is very intimidating and it doesn't need to be. Um, it's just science. Uh, <laughs> and but next year I hope to do a Blanc de Blanc. I would love to work with just solely Chardonnay. Um, being that I'm so obsessed with it from working with Josh and Louisa, they make some beautiful wines and um, I think it's just a, a really sophisticated um, version of sparkling wine. Mm -hmm. So I wanna have all of the different flavors for my label mm -hmm. and um, hopefully maybe even a non-vintage. Um, I think that Oregon sparkling wine has so much ability right now to um, kind of just define where they want to be mm -hmm. because consumers don't know. That's such a great thing. I mean, we can kind of push it where we want it to go. Um, we know Argyle, people know Mum and Napa, and maybe Stromsburg, Stromsburg. I mean, if they're really getting into sparkling wine. Um, but, you know, there's the whole new wave of pet gnats, and I think that's gonna lead the way into more serious wine once, for sparkling, mm -hmm. once people are ready. Mm -hmm. um, and once they come, we come out of this like 2020 black hole. 
where they want to like spend some wine and celebrate. Like I think we're gonna set be set up pretty well for Oregon um, sparkling wine. Mm -hmm. And obviously it takes a long time to make it. Um, but I think the benefits are so worthwhile. Mm -hmm. um, and we're just really set up well for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, Oregon is, we're, you know, we're Pinot, we're Chard. More Pinot Meunier is being planted as we see it. And then there's this whole wave of like using alternative varietals for sparkling. And that's like another exciting thing that we get to play with because we aren't champagne. And, you know, I'm friends with some champagne grower people. Um, their families have houses and they're just always so in awe of Oregon because we have the ability to just do whatever we want. And I think we really should take advantage mm -hmm. of that and not just limit ourselves to the normal Oregon Pinot or, you know, Pinot Gris. And if we're gonna survive, I mean, Sonoma in California, like, you know, they're, those winemakers are really pushing the envelope. Mm -hmm. They're worlds ahead in like, so we need to, we need to step it up. And I think people are, I know lots of, you know, younger winemakers are coming out and, and making their, their, um, their labels. And mm -hmm. I just, I hope more people can have a story like mine where it's, you just make it work mm -hmm. and it doesn't, you don't need to set really high standards and for yourself, you just need to make your story heard um, and, and share it with people. So in addition to the vines here, obviously you mentioned it's a, it's a, it's a farm, it's a yeah. homestead. Tell me about the, what the, what have you done so far here, what you kind of came into and what the plan is for the site as well as for the vines. Yeah, um, so we bought the property, there's, um, one home and then one unfinished home on the property. Um, and this is on 38 acres. We, we want it to be a generational home. So when I have kids that my parents can be involved, my younger brother and older brother can, you know, always be here and be a part of this. And, and I think from being a part of like, family-run businesses like the Bergstroms and Ponzi's, it made me realize how much I need my family and um, want to share this wonderful thing about farming together mm -hmm. and working together. Mm -hmm. um, I know it sounds really stupid, but um, it's just so beautiful and it's so like um, ideal, but um, it's probably the best thing that's ever happened to my family mm -hmm. and me mm -hmm. um, buying this property. So we bought this property and there were Dexter cattle here. We've got about um, probably 15 acres of pasture. And then we, you know, we went through the COVID uh, like, oh my God, we need to like prepare for the end of the world thing. So. We got, um, at the time, I don't think we have that many now, but we have like 26 chickens and ducks. And we were like, okay, should we get pigs? And we're like, no, 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 no. Let's cool, slow our roll. We have, um, <laughs> but then I got strong-armed into getting sheep um, because Louise's son, Carlo, who's a little rancher man, um, convinced me to get baby doll sheep. So now I have um, 12 sheep, um, which are really cool and I'm really excited about them because, <laughs> but um, yeah, so, you know, the, sh the cows are here so we can raise meat for ourselves and sell it to friends. Um, and they're so cute. And then, <laughs> The sheep are here so we can, um, you know, keep weed management in the orchard. We've got um, about 200 different fruit trees planted here all throughout. And they're not super mature yet, but, you know, it's kind of like the whole 
like generational home. Like this is going to be a place where we will um, grow into. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so the the sheep are for the grazing of the weed management in the orchard and in the vineyard. And we've got table grapes. We have way too many table grapes. Um, so hopefully transferring some of those into wine grapes in the future. Um, we're kind of uh, thinking about laying out the orchard with um, more wine grapes for biodiversity. Um, the They began planting it so it is um, very biodiverse. And so it doesn't make any sense because where it's planted is like the best place to plant wine grapes. So it's really frustrating, um, but it's also really awesome because it gives you this opportunity to think about, wow, well, maybe we shouldn't be just like producing things based on a um, normal um, economic agricultural scale. Like, mm -hmm. Let's think about it in a way that would be best for our land. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to put in some more grapes and I hope to put in some maybe like gamay or ganache. Um, being that it's lower elevation here, I think that it would be a shame to not. <laughs> um, and I'd love to put in Chardonnay, but it's just not going to go well here. Mm -hmm. It's just not going to work. Um, and then we have the world's largest vegetable garden. <laughs> We've got about uh, 80 raised beds, which, and then there were like 20 more before that. And so we're working on consolidating things into more manageable spaces <laughs> um, because you can't do that. Uh, it's just so much of a headache. The people that own this place originally wanted to make it into a um, like a learning farm, mm -hmm. so teaching people how to to farm on small scale and bring it into their lives, which is such a wonderful um, vision, but it's just not what we wanted to do. Um, and it, this will allow us to be sustainable in our own home, um, multiple multiple families. Um, I hope to, you know, get into selling produce to. Um, farmers markets and direct to restaurants and stuff but we're not there yet and um, obviously the markets are just so different now um, what I'd planned to do wasn't possible and so I'm just kind of going through this like well we could do this well we could do this and then it's like nope that doesn't work 2020 scraps all of the plans and you have to like just pivot and that's just the whole part of mm -hmm. 2020 is mm -hmm. mm, you know being resilient mm -hmm. um but yeah this this land is pretty pretty wonderful and um i can't wait for the future of it and the development of us growing into it and managing it um in a sustainable way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. awesome so tell me about your your first impression of the Oregon wine industry whether that was when you were at Oregon State or, or afterward what was your first impression of, of Oregon wine and how is it different today how how is your impression of it changed or how has the industry changed today yeah well I mean when I was I didn't really think about it when I was at Oregon State I knew it was there and it was always something like well I'll get to it when I get to it <laughs> Um, and then when I came here and moved to McMinnville, I was shocked and it was amazing. Like the people are so kind and you really feel um, at home here and the amount of, um, you know, generosity and kindness that anyone will you can just have a conversation with someone on the street and it's like no big deal. Coming from San Diego, we're like, oh, I'm so sorry I looked you in the eye. <laughs> um, it's a different world. Um, but just the ingenuity as well really drew it to me um, when thinking about what places and that's what kept me here. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought I thought about leaving multiple times just because it wasn't really working out. but. Being in Oregon, 
there's a lot of boundaries that have been broken down because of um, leadership for women. And it's a great opportunity. You know, you don't, you, you have, there's still room to grow in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about it. Um, yeah. We talked a couple times about obviously all, all, all of the things from 2020 and mm -hmm. uh, we, with the pandemic specifically, um, obviously it affected your plans with the farm. Tell me about how else it affected your kind of work life, uh, life at Ponzi, and, and also uh, how, you, how you saw it affect the industry at, more at large. Well, um, I, I took a step back um, at the beginning of, of COVID and because we didn't know when we were going to get back to normal with, um, so I was not working there for about two months and just working here at the farm and trying to just like focus on this and make it happen. Um, and I was just going crazy. I was like, I can't do this anymore. Like everyone else. Um, so I went back to work. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> and Louisa was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, um, but yeah, we were, we had a really weird year. Um, we were planning on having some staff changes. Um, our assistant winemaker, who had, or associate winemaker, who had been there for like 12 years, was moving on. And so that happened earlier than we thought it was gonna happen. Um, it put a pause on all of our bottlings. We, I remember Trump had talked on you know, the TV and said, we're basically shutting down, da 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 da. And that day we had set up the winery to basically step away for as long as we didn't know, we didn't know how long. And so that was like a mad rush just to get everything set. And it was so scary. And Louisa wasn't even in the state. So that was scary. And, um, but 2020 also has like allowed for us to really reach our full potential because we've, we can do all of this. And we've had everything just turn upside down with like, we lost all of our interns in like because of COVID and had to rehire everyone. And we usually just do all internationals and we had to pull from local talent. And that was really hard. And we had to rethink how we were going to just communicate within our cellar um, and how we were going to make cat management happen. Because, you know, at Ponzi, we have, we have a lot of ferments. We probably have like 60 ferments at a time going of just Pinot tanks and three ton Pinot tanks. And you're constantly on top of one another. So we had to like create zones of like, you work through this zone and don't touch anything. And, and so, and then no one was allowed in any of the lab other than like the lab people. And we had to make a contingency plan of like, if, the winemaker or sister winemaker got COVID and mm -hmm. it was just really scary. Mm -hmm. And then we got the fires and everything that we had planned for where we were gonna, we were gonna have such a smooth harvest because we'd prepared for all of the COVID things. And we're like, it's gonna be bad, but we can handle it. And we're really optimistic. And then we had the fires and I don't think I've had a harvest that I've been that like, there's like, there's physical draining and then there's like emotional and mental draining. And that was, this was hard. And we've had to pivot a lot and think about instead of like, instead of thinking about making the best wine that we can, we were thinking, well, this is an opportunity for us to learn for the future and experiment as much as possible because it's not gonna be what we want it to be it's there's no possibility and we did micro ferments I think I had probably 40 micro ferments going it was so awful 
and it was just so hard to keep track of everything and then we would assess based off of our you know analysis numbers on what was worth you know actually doing mm -hmm. and it's heartbreaking to see not bringing in fruit and the fruit was so beautiful mm -hmm. um but you know we learned a lot and we just tasted through all of our 2020 pinots and it's hopeful which is the best thing out of it is we weren't expecting anything and it's not that bad mm -hmm. i mean hope, fingers crossed it's always a ticking time bomb but um i think that 2020 has set us up for being more adaptable in the future mm -hmm. and you know we had always been very like experimental motivated but it it really starting with a whole new like leadership dynamic at ponzi and you know really really rocking it in a year like that it's like yeah we we can handle this and we we can be confident in our skills which is a wonderful thing to say mm -hmm. um because 2020 was awful and we kept a smile going through it under our masks <laughs> but yeah it was cool what about the future for you? Mm. What, do you what do you see for for yourself and, and for your project here and and also for yourself at ponzi um so i think i think that i'm not trying to plan for a a huge change for myself i'm i want to more focus in on my own property and the grape growing here um, where we have a vineyard manager right now and I'd love to take over at some point and do it myself um, but I think that's part of like the whole evolution is getting the foresight of the vineyard along with the winemaking I I can do the winemaking and I see that and I I just want to focus in on more um, keeping things, you know, in balance mm -hmm. in our environment. Um, I love to expand my brand, you know. Um, first I have to sell some. <laughs> uh, so we'll see how that goes. But, you know, I, I hope that I, you know, in 10 years I'm a winemaker somewhere and um, it doesn't have to be at Ponzi. Um, I love working for that family. They're so good to me. Um, and they're, you know, you have a team of like three winemakers working. You get to talk to Eric Homaker all the time and Dick Ponzi and Louisa Ponzi and then just get all of the, I'm just, I'm so happy to have landed there and lucky. Um, so the the Oregon wine future to me is very bright and I I'm very happy to be a part of it because I think there's gonna be a lot of change in the next few years maybe not on the winemaking style um, but I think we have got a big task ahead of us in terms of thinking about where we're going to be pulling our um, workforce from because I don't see people hopping harvests in the future. Um, I'm really looking forward to all of the work that um, Sofia Torres has done with iVoy and you know making that happen because um, I mean we have tons of um, Hispanic people that work in our cellars and they're some of the most you know intelligent people and knowledgeable and skillful people and they need to have the opportunity to the same opportunity that I've that I've had I mean everyone Oregon history for wine is not yet done we don't we're not quite we're not there yet it's not it's not finished mm -hmm. um, so I, I hope that more companies really start taking advantage of 
bringing skillful um, workers into their mm -hmm. teams. Mm -hmm. And then I really, really hope that we take our sustainable practices um, in all, all, um, like, types of business management and like the vineyard and the winery and you know shipping i hope that we all can as, as an industry can really do use oregon wine as like a benchmark of of sustainability um i think that we've done a really good job to start and it's really brought emphasis on going back to not not just doing um, mach uh, machine harvested, mm -hmm. everything machine wise and relying on um, fossil fuels. I think that a lot of vineyards and um, vineyard managers are trying to think about the whole holistic part of it as well as the people because it's just a lot of hard work. So um, utilizing sheep for grazing for one thing, <laughs> um, utilizing our, our uh, our excess products like pumice and you know actually actually composting it and not just putting it in a bin and sending it off to a landfill like there's so many things that we can do on our own to to set standards for the rest of the world in the wine industry um, so I'm really excited about that and I I can't wait to start for you know Ponzi to do more and for others to learn about it and see that it's it's not like a financial strain. Mm -hmm. It's more, it's a necessary evil <laughs> for us to, to survive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned um, kind of the, the path you took, maybe not being a path that's gonna be either, uh, either possible or, or necessarily expected for, for future people. So I'm curious if you had someone come to you today and say they were interested in, in doing what you've done and, and, and getting into knowledge in viticulture, getting into the Oregon wine industry, what would your words of wisdom to them be? I'd say, you know, do what I did about, you know, tasting all over, but I think that there's plenty of things to learn in our own country, probably, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, just knocking on that door, even if other people aren't really welcoming. Um, and I hope that they just not it's not stop trying. Um, there there was so much fun to hopping harvest, and that's one thing that I really hope that we don't stop doing because that's why most young people stick with it is because it's so fun, um, and the it weeds it weeds people out um, when it gets harder and more difficult. Um, it weeds people out when they, um, you know, work in Oregon Harvest and see what, what actually happens. Um, so I just say to them, like, stick with it because it's going to be hard and it's not going to be easy and it's going to be repetitive and suck. But there's a lot of great things that can come from it. Um, just like everything in life right now, like we kind of just have to wait it out. But that's the hard thing about being so young and like entering the world and being so passionate about something like, it seems like it'll take a really long time. And it felt like it took a really long time for me too. And I had the opportunity to travel so much and experience so much. Mm -hmm. So being a person that's really imp impatient and really ambitious, um, I just tell them to wait mm -hmm. and allow for the process because mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be okay. Just like making the wine. Yeah. It's so, so <laughs> true. <laughs> <laughs> well, excellent, excellent advice. And I, I think now more than ever, maybe ever that pa patience is a virtue for all of yeah. us, right? So. It's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> So that's all the questions that I have thank for you, you today. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have, anything we didn't no, cover? That's so great. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for thank your time, you. your hospitality, for your great story and answers. And uh, we'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Perfect. Thank you.